Chapter Twenty Two, Part Three of A Short History of Scotland by Andrew Lang, read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter Twenty Two, Reign of James the Sixth, Part Three. During the next fifteen years, the reign of James and his struggle for freedom from the Kirk was perturbed by a long series of intrigues, of which the details are too obscure and too complex for presentation here. His chief minister was now John Maitland, a brother of Lethington and as versatile, unscrupulous, and intelligent as the rest of that house. Maitland had actually been present, as Lethington's representative, at the tragedy of the Kirkle Field. He was Protestant, and favoured the party of England. In the state the chief parties were the Presbyterian nobles, the majority of the gentry or lards, and the preachers on one side, and the great Catholic families of Huntley, Morton, the title being now held by a Maxwell, Errol and Crawford on the other. Bothwell, a sister's son of Mary's Bothwell, flitted meteor-like, more Catholic than anything else, but always plotting to seize James's person, and in this he was backed by the widow of Gowrie and the preachers, and encouraged by Elizabeth. In her fear that James would join the Catholic nobles, whom the preachers eternally urged him to persecute, Elizabeth smiled on the Protestant plots, thereby, of course, fostering any inclination which James may have felt to seek Catholic aid at home and abroad. The plots of Mary were perpetually confused by intrigues of priestly emissaries, who interfered with the schemes of Spain and mixed in the interests of the Guises. A fact which proved to be of the highest importance was the passing, in July 1587, of an act by which much of the ecclesiastical property of the ancient church was attached to the crown, to be employed in providing for the maintenance of the clergy. But James used much of it in making temporal lordships, for example, at the time of the mysterious Gowrie conspiracy, August 1600, we find that the Earl of Gowrie had obtained the church lands of the Abbey of Scone, which his brother, the Master of Ruthven, desired. With the large revenues now at his disposal, James could buy the support of the baronage, who, after the execution in 1584 of the Earl of Gowrie, the father of the gallery of the conspiracy of 1600, are not found leading and siding with the ministers in a resolute way. By 1600 young gallery was the only hope of the preachers, and probably James's ability to enrich the nobles helped to make them stand aloof. Meanwhile fears and hopes of the success of the Spanish Armada held the minds of the Protestants and of the Catholic earls. In this world Walter, as James said, no Scot moved for Spain except that Lord Maxwell, who had first received and then been deprived of the earldom of Morton. James advanced against him in Dumfrieshire and caused his flight. As for the Armada, many ships drifted northward around Scotland, and one great vessel, blown up in Tibermory Bay by Lachlan Maclean of Duart, still invites the attention of treasure-hunters. THE CATHOLIC EARLS Early in 1589 Elizabeth became mistress of some letters which proved that the Catholic girls, Huntley and Errol, were intriguing with Spain. The offence was lightly passed over, but when the earls, with Crawford and Montrose, drew to a head in the north, James, with much more than his usual spirit, headed the army which advanced against them. They fled from him near Aberdeen, surrendered, and were for a brief time imprisoned. As nobody knows how fortune's wheel may turn, and as James, hard-pressed by the preachers, could neglect no chance of support, he would never gratify the Kirk by crushing the Catholic girls. By temperament he was no persecutor. His calculated leniency caused him years of trouble. Meanwhile James, after issuing a grotesque proclamation about the causes of his spirited resolve, sailed in October to woo a sea king's daughter from over the foam, the Princess Anne of Denmark. After happy months passed, he wrote, in drinking and driving o'er, he returned with his bride in May 1590. The General Assembly then ordered prayers for the Puritans oppressed in England. None the less, Elizabeth, the oppressor, continued to patronize the plots of the Puritans of Scotland. They now lent their approval to the foe of James's minister, Maitland, namely the wild Francis Stuart, Earl of Bothwell, a sister's son of Mary's Bothwell. This young man had the engaging quality of gay and absolute recklessness. He was dear to ladies, and the wild young gentry of Lothian and the borders. He broke prisons, released friends, dealt with wizards, aided by Lady Gowrie, stole into Holyrood, his ruling ambition being to capture the king. 
The preachers prayed for sanctified plagues against James, and regarded Bothwell favorably as a sanctified plague. A strange conspiracy within the clan Campbell, in which Huntley and Maitland were implicated, now led to the murder, among others, of the Bonnie Earl of Murray by Huntley in partnership with Maitland, February 1592. James was accused of having instigated this crime, from suspicion of Murray as a partner in the wild enterprises of Bothwell, and he was so hard pressed by sermons, that, early in the summer of 1592, he allowed the black axe to be abrogated, and the charter of the liberties of the Kirk to be passed. One of these liberties was to persecute Catholics in accordance with the penal acts of 1560. The Kirk was almost an imperium in imperio, but was still prohibited from appointing the time and place of its own general assemblies without royal assent. This weak point in their defences enabled James to vanquish them, but in June Bothwell attacked him in the palace of Falkland, and put him in considerable peril. The end of 1592 and the opening of 1593 were remarkable for the discovery of the Spanish blanks, papers addressed to Philip of Spain, signed by Huntley, the new Earl of Angus, and Errol, to be filled up with an oral message requesting military aid for Scottish Catholics. Such proceedings make our historians hold up obtesting hands against the perfidy of idolaters. But clearly, if Knox and the congregation were acting rightly when they besought the aid of England against Mary of Guise, then Errol and Huntley are not to blame for inviting Spain to free them from persecution. Some inkling of the scheme had reached James, and a paper in which he weighed the pros and cons is in existence. His suspected understanding with the Catholic girls, whom he merely did not wish to estrange hopelessly, was punished by a sanctified plague. On July 24, 1593, by aid of the late Earl Gowrie's daughter, Bothwell entered Holyrood, seized the king, extorted his own terms, went and amazed the Dean of Durham by his narrative of the adventure, and seemed to have the connivance of Elizabeth. But in September James found himself in a position to repudiate his forced engagement. Bothwell now allied himself with the Catholic girls, and as a Catholic, had no longer the prayers of the preachers. James ordered levies to attack the earls, while Argyle led his clan and the Macleans against Huntley, only to be defeated by the Gordon horse at the Battle of Glenrinnes, October 3rd. Huntley and his allies, however, dared not encounter King James and Andrew Melville, who marched together against them, and they were obliged to flee to the continent. Bothwell, with his retainer Colville, continued, with Cecil's connivance, to make desperate plots for seizing James. Indeed, Cecil was intriguing with them and other desperadoes even after 1600. Throughout all the Tudor period, from Henry the Seventh to 1601, England was engaged in a series of conspiracies against the persons of the princes of Scotland. The Catholics of the south of Scotland now lost Lord Maxwell, slain by a Lockerbie Lick, in a great clan battle with the Johnstones at Dreyfus Sands. In 1595 James's minister, John Maitland, brother of Lethington, died, and early in 1596 an organization called the Octavians was made to regulate the distracted finance of the country. On October 13, 1596, Walter Scott of Buccleuch made himself an everlasting name by the bloodless rescue of Kenmont Willie, and Armstrong Reaver, from the castle of Carlisle, where he was illegally held by Lord Scrope. The period is notable for the endless raids by the clans on both sides of the border, celebrated in battles. James had determined to recall the exiled Catholic girls, undeterred by the eloquence of the last of all our sincere assemblies, held with deep emotion in March 1596. The earls came home. In September, at Falkland Palace, Andrew Melville seized James by the sleeve, called him God's silly vassal, and warned him that Christ and his kirk were the king's overlords. Soon afterwards Mr. David Black of St. Andrews spoke against Elizabeth in a sermon which caused diplomatic remonstrances. Black would be tried, in the first instance, only by a spiritual court of his brethren. There was a long struggle. The ministers appointed a kind of standing committee of safety. James issued a proclamation dissolving it, and on December 17th, Inflammatory sermons led a deputation to try to visit James, who was with the Lords of Session in the Tolbooth. Whether an alarm of a popish plot or not, the crowd became so fierce and menacing that the great Lachlan Maclean of Duart rode to Stirling to bring up Argyle in the King's defence, with such forces as he could muster. 
the king retired to Linlithgow. The Reverend Mr. Bruce, a famous preacher credited with powers of prophecy, in vain appealed to the Duke of Hamilton to lead the godly. By threatening to withdraw the court and courts of justice from Edinburgh, James brought the citizens to their knees, and was able to take order with the preachers. End of chapter 22. Read by Sibella Denton. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.